to hear everybody. Uh, thank you all and welcome alumni, parents, and friends of Mercesburg Academy. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Holly Trostel, alumni and parent relations officer here at Mercesburg and a current parent. So thank you for being here with us. Um, tonight, we're gonna hear from three alumni and one faculty member um, who are outdoor enthusiasts, each in their own right on how they release from stresses of the ER, uh, get joy out of the social camaraderie of climbing, and have an e or have had an ego death experience by summiting one of the world's largest peaks. Um, as an introduction to each of our presenters, I'm going to share a brief bio so you can hear more about their experiences and, and them. Paige Harry is an emergency medicine resident physician at University Medical Center in Las Vegas. She graduated from West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine in May 2020, and she is also a captain in the United States Air Force. She graduated from Mercesburg in 2010. She lived in South Cottage, played soccer, was the editor of the yearbook, and participated in Mercesburg outdoor education. Mo taught her to be innovative and resourceful. It also taught her to endure, uh, endure through tough times, even when feeling exhausted and uncomfortable. These are the skills that she uses every day when she's working long hours in a pandemic uh, for an overcrowded and underfunded hospital. Uh, Mo has also gave her an appreciation for the outdoors, which allows her to stay energized and enthusiastic about her career and life. Carson White is business leadership program associate at LinkedIn in their Chicago office. He is a member of the Mercesburg class of 2016 and graduated from Elon University in May of 2020. At Mercesburg, he was a captain of the varsity wrestling team, a proud member of the third soccer team. He, is, he credits most of his desire to travel and explore to the diverse international community that Mercesburg promoted. Michael Yu is an applications engineer working for Keysight Technologies in Santa Rosa, California. He obtained his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Purdue University in May, 2020. And like Carson, he graduated from Mercesburg in 2016. At Mercesburg, he was concert master of the String Ensemble, a one year semester varsity diver and a four season bow rock climber under the tutelage of Pete Gunkelman, Jeff Ott, Kristen Pixler and Jen Smith. Climbing has since become his life's greatest passion and one that he loves to document through photography and videography. The experience and knowledge that he's gained through Mo allowed him to share his passion for the sport with people he met in college and has given him many lifelong friends that he literally trusts his life with in their hands as they climb together. And Pete Gunkelman has served as director of Mercesburg Outdoor Education since 2013 after arriving in 2006 as assistant director. Pete began his journey as a winter camper in the boundary waters of Minnesota. During his undergraduate years at University of Richmond, he took a job in an indoor climbing gym and quickly developed a passion for the sport. Today, Pete guides trips both domestically and abroad and enjoys sharing his love for the natural world with his students. When he's not in the Macenter Outdoor Education Center setting, he is uh, and making sure he's checking the gear, making sure everything's in order. Pete can be found biking, climbing, kayaking, or passing those passions on to his two daughters. Pete holds the Marjorie and Edgar Miss Center 48 chair for the outdoor education director. Uh, please note, we are recording this session and I'm just gonna go ahead and hand this off to our moderator, Pete Gunkelman. Welcome everybody, so excited. I am incredibly excited to see everybody. I have my best background right here. Um, it's just very indoorsy of me. Um, so welcome to this kind of unprecedented gathering. Um, I am really, really excited to be able to um, have the, the variety of inputs from the different alums that are presenting, but also to see each of you, because I get to connect to each of you um, in different ways. Welcome former head of school, Mr. Bergen. Um, and Barbara looks as well. Uh, and I would say, um, welcome to everybody. The former director of Outdoor Ed has, has joined us as well, uh, Derry Mason, uh, without whom I would not have been the assistant. Um, so welcome to one and all. And I would like to uh, open up by just saying kind of the format for this. We are going to hear from Paige Harry, and then we'll hear from Michael and then Carson. Um, 
and a little bit from me, uh, hopefully not a ton. And then after we've gone through everybody, then we'll open up to uh, a little Q&A and then uh, you'll be able to type questions into the chat and then I'll, uh, I'll ask those and our panelists can answer them, okay? Um, again, welcome. Uh, one more person I wanted to mention, um, man, there are a ton of you, um, but I wanted to point out our assistant director currently, Sarah Bozzi has joined us as well as former assistant director, Sue Malone is also in the call. So there's just a, a who's who of outdoor ed here, which is so fun to see. Um, and then prior to outdoor ed, as a department, we have uh, the esteemed Jim Malone who headed up the Trek program, um, the precursor to, to outdoor education at the school for a long time. So um, I'm going to let either Holly or uh, Denise, one of you has Paige's video queued up and ready to go. So with that, we'll start. My name is Paige Harry. I am a Mercersburg graduate from the class of 2010. I apologize for not being able to be live on the Zoom meeting with you all, but I hopefully can share some valuable lessons and experiences I have from my time at Mercersburg in the outdoor program and where it's led me today. So we will start with a little bit of, I guess, a lesson learned <laughs> from this snow cave building here. Um, this was a program called Endeavor, which I don't think is around anymore, but it was a winter camping program. And we had this great idea on this snow day to build this epic snow cave. It was going to be huge. This is me in the red, by the way. And uh, I think this is Pete here. <laughs> but um, this cave was going to be huge, and we were all going to be able to fit inside of it. And we had just about finished after working for hours, and it just collapsed. Um, so we had this great idea, didn't really turn out as planned, but it's okay if you have great ideas and they don't go as planned because the experiences you have along the way, um, and the relationships you build, that's, that's what matters. That's what you live with and you learn from. This is another great idea that didn't really go as planned. This was a camping trip that um, Pete had invited me to come back for I think this was in 2014. We were out near Moab. We didn't anticipate to have snow in the desert. I don't think we had the appropriate layers. Um, we were really cold and our stove would not boil water. And so we ate the soggiest but crunchiest noodles. It was the weirdest consistency. <laughs> and we were a little bit miserable that night, but we laughed a lot and the experiences we had from that trip are just unforgettable. So sometimes our great ideas, look how beautiful that is. It looks pretty epic, but behind the scenes, it was a little bit miserable that night, but regardless, it was a great experience, a great adventure. <laughs> Here's another great idea that clearly I wasn't that thrilled about. This was an ice climbing trip in New Hampshire my senior year. No, I'm sorry, I think it was my junior year. Either way, I decided to go on this spring break trip with Mo to New Hampshire for ice climbing. Same time a GI bug started going around our group. A couple people got sent home. I don't think I'd quite experienced the GI bug sitting here, but maybe it was coming on. I was tired, hypothermic maybe a little bit, hungry and just waiting for my time to ice climb. I thought this, you know, this was gonna be great adventure, hiking, camping in the back country of New Hampshire in the winter, going ice climbing. But I have to say that the GI bug did get the best me. Sue Malone and I had to hike out of the back country and it wasn't very pleasant when uh, you can't keep any food or water down, but I will have to say I've never been ice climbing since then. And the experiences that I had along the way, the lessons I learned are still priceless. Speaking of Sue Malone, she's full of great ideas. <laughs> we had so many adventures together through high school and even afterwards. Um, she got me into ultra running. She took me on our first couple of trail adventures. We would get lost, we'd get stuck in the dark, we'd be tired and cold and hungry. 
and I'm a little bit miserable, but at some of the times I'll never forget. And I think for some reason, she just got me hooked on these adventures. Um, you know, we had always had these great ideas, but sometimes it didn't go as planned, but you know, it's okay. Like this race, she convinced me to do this 50K in Ohio, it was in December. It was 30, maybe 35 degrees and pouring rain. Just ideal setting for developing hypothermia. Also, it was 30 miles going through ankle deep mud. Um, that was the most mentally exhausting race just because each step is about five times harder than it needed to be, and it was so difficult. But we both survived, maybe a little hypothermic, but we made it through. Um, just one of her great ideas, but it, in reality, it's the experiences and the lessons I learned from her along the way um, just kind of put me where I am today. So more about where I am. I told you I graduated from Mercersburg. I then went to JMU and I would join the triathlon club, got into mountain biking a bit. And then towards the end of college, I realized I hate swimming and maybe the most inefficient person in water secondary to a rock but I, I'm right I'm right there next to the the rock in the water but um, I decided that I didn't like swimming so I didn't really want to keep doing triathlons but I loved running loved being out on the road the trail um, just the miles of solitude and thinking and listening to podcasts and books and whatever else. Um, this was a race I did after college, 248 miles across Virginia in nine days. It was a great idea, but it was actually kind of miserable along the way. It was hot, it was humid, it was tired. That was, that was a challenge, um, but I did it thanks to the support crews that I had, the friends, the people I met along the way, and it's an experience that I will never, ever forget. I then went to graduate school for a year before going to medical school. And while I was in medical school, I also joined the Air Force. Oh, sorry, I guess I should be using this laser pointer, but I was just pointing to pictures, which you can probably follow. <laughs> so um, I joined the Air Force in medical school through a scholarship program. I recently graduated from medical school, which is four years, and now I'm in emergency medicine residency. And uh, this is my fiance, Stephen, and I, we moved to Las Vegas for my residency. And so this is our backyard now. It's about two miles from our house, so not technically our backyard, but close enough. Um, life is really, really busy in the emergency room in Las Vegas. Um, I'm working at the biggest trauma center. It's a busy hospital. It's right, it's right downtown. Um, <clears throat> I spend a lot of my time in the hospital doing things uh, medical related. This was me. This is not my hand. This was just practicing casting and splinting. Um, this was someone else's hand. A really good idea that didn't turn out as they planned, but she just got her nails done too. Anyways. Um, I spend a lot of time in the hospital, a lot of time working, but my time outside is extremely valuable. And Mercersburg and the outdoor program really taught me to value the great outdoors. Um, it also taught me some great critical thinking skills, like how, what to do with this mangled hand, how to manage these crazy emergency room patients and cases, things you've never seen before, never heard of before, and you kind of have to critically think through it. Some of those skills I learned while I was in Endeavor, you know, your stove doesn't work, you're camping outside, you're cold, how do you figure things out? Um, it really taught me some valuable lessons along the way. <laughs> um, and sometimes that I'll never forget, and definitely still, still sometimes some experiences, some values lessons I've learned that I still use today every day in the emergency room. Um, just to wrap up, 
it's okay if your great ideas don't always go as planned. Um, just value your experience in a relationship along the way. That's what matters. That's what you'll learn from. And never lose sight of what you love. Um, I am working a lot right now, but I still get out and run on the trails every day I have off. Um, it's my time to decompress from the emergency room. It's my time to just enjoy the outdoors. I guess it's a little bit spiritual in a way just because you're alone, you're on the trail. It's your time to reflect and process on everything from the week or, you know, from your couple shifts that you had. Um, find something that you love and never, never lose sight of that no matter what you're doing. You know, if you're in school still, if you're planning on joining the military or what are the, whatever other life plans you might have, um, just keep your hobbies and values close by. Um, those are very important. So if you have any questions about medicine, ultra running, the Air Force, anything else, please feel free to reach out. Um, again, I apologize for not being able to be there in person. I hopefully I could still provide a little inspiration, a little bit of life lessons along the way. Um, thanks for listening. Paige uh, has invited me to receive some, uh, some questions via the chat. And she said that she is going to be attentive to her device while she's in the ER in the trauma center in Las Vegas, where nothing exciting ever happens. Um, so if we do have some questions, she's happy to answer them if she's available. So we'll get to those in a little bit. Now I'd like to introduce Michael Yu, um, and he will uh, also have a, a little bit of a visual slideshow for us, which would be great. Michael, take it away. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So let me know if this works. <laughs> Everyone can see that? Yes. Cool. All right. All right. So, hey, everyone. My name is Michael. Uh, Holly already gave you guys a brief bio of me at the beginning of this session, so I won't bother with repeating the stuff that isn't important. I am going to talk a lot about rock climbing, though. More specifically, I'm mainly going to talk about my time in Mo and how it shaped my life and the person that I am now, as well as touching a little bit on what my experience with Mo enabled me to do in college with my climbing. Also, the photos that are scrolling through on the screen right now are just random highlights from various trips I've taken over the past four years during my time at Purdue. And they don't really have too much relevance to what I'm gonna talk about since I didn't get into climbing photography until I graduated from Mercersburg and there wouldn't really be too much for you guys to take away from this presentation if I just rambled on about the details of photography and how cool slash difficult individual routes or climbing areas are. Plus, I think photos speak much better for themselves rather than me attempting to impress random strangers with stories about my climbing achievements. These photos are just there so that you guys don't have to stare at my face the entire time. Okay, so for the purposes of this presentation, I wanna focus on three factors of Mo climbing that really stood out to me and still do to this day. These three are the holistic educational aspect of the Mo programs themselves, the incredibly welcoming and non-gatekeeping nature of the coaches, which was subsequently passed down to veterans of the program. And finally, the social camaraderie and lifelong friendships that I otherwise wouldn't have necessarily immediately found if I just started climbing in a regular climbing gym. Notably absent from this list are the physical and mental challenges of rock climbing as a sport. These are no doubt important aspects of climbing, especially to someone like me, who is absolutely obsessed with training and getting stronger, but any rock climber you meet can talk your head off for hours about the nerdy minute details of a specific route that they're working on that honestly most non-climbers wouldn't be interested in. For the actual rock climbers on this call, I would love to connect with you afterward and get super nerdy about climbing technique and training and logistics. But once again, for the non-climbers, I thought it would make a lot more sense now for me to speak on my favorite aspects of Mo and the sport in general that you guys can still relate to. 
So first, Mo in general, not just the rock climbing program, is treated more as an actual semester course like math or science, rather than just a random after school sport or other PGA. When you sign up for a Mo course, you're obviously signing up for the physical and mental exertion, but you're also signing up to learn how to thrive and survive in the outdoors. In regard to the climbing program specifically, this included topics like anchor building, safe lead climbing practices, and how to effectively use a guidebook to navigate a new unfamiliar climbing area. We also obviously learned actual climbing techniques and training protocols to get stronger like you would at a regular climbing gym. But the lessons that were taught about the safety and logistics of climbing have made me into a much more confident and self-assured climber compared to someone who just started in a gym. It also led me into multiple positions of leadership during my years at Purdue, where I was constantly leading outdoor climbing trips for my friends that were less experienced climbers. The knowledge I learned from Mo allowed me to actually work as a part-time climbing instructor at Purdue's Climbing Wall, where I taught newcomers to the sport how to top rope belay and even eventually lead belay and lead climb, which is similar to the role that I had during my very last season of climbing at Mercersburg. Both of these positions at Purdue and Mercersburg made me realize just how important mentorship can be, even outside of a context like rock climbing or even outdoor sports in general. Having someone like Pete to teach me and help me grow as a climber, but more importantly, as a person was monumental for my personal growth and wellness. Perhaps even more importantly, it gave me the passion to then act as a mentor for other people to pass on my knowledge and to help new climbers become confident enough to lead their own climbing trips without me in the future. And I think that's ultimately the goal of any teacher for their students to eventually surpass them and to continue that cycle for future generations. And at Mercersburg specifically, none of this would have been possible without the amazing coaches that Mo has, which is the second aspect I wanted to talk about. I only ever participated in the climbing program so I can't really say much about the hiking, cycling, or winter sport coaches, but I've heard great things about them from my friends who did participate in some of those programs. I personally just wanna take a moment to highlight the four people who were my coaches and how each one affected my personal growth. It seems like not all of them can make it to this event, but I still want to talk about them anyways, since they mean so much to me. Jeff, I think Jeff's here. All right, I see him in the participant list. Okay, so Jeff Ott is a retired large animal vet who was the only one of my four coaches present for all four seasons since he didn't have any other commitments to Mercersburg as a teacher or dorm parent. He's been climbing for longer than I've been alive, and so his expertise was always something that I could depend on. But more importantly, his easygoing nature made him feel more like a friend slash peer rather than strictly just a mentor. For a young introverted Michael, friends were few and far between, and I was grateful that I could always chat with Jeff like an old friend. So I think Kristen is the only one that's not here, but I'll still take a moment to talk about her. Kristen Pixler is the second coach I'd like to talk about a bit. She was only present during my two spring seasons as a climber, but she was still an invaluable inspiration to me, not only as a climber, but more importantly, as a phot photographer. I took her photography class during my last semester at the Berg and her lessons and experience as a commercial photographer was what eventually prompted me to take my own photography more seriously after I graduated, which I am eternally grateful for since photography is now arguably my next biggest passion after climbing. Next, Jen Smith. I think I saw Jen in here. Yeah, she's actually here. Cool. Hi, Jen. Um, so Jen Smith, who most people in my year, I think, knew as a chemistry teacher, but I think current students know her more as the Dean of Academics. Jen was also one of my coaches for the two spring semesters I participated in. And what I always loved about Jen was how she pushed her students to maximize their potential, but in a safe, controlled, and healthy manner. Climbing always came super easily to me. Uh, so this was a side of her that became much more apparent when she was my diving coach during my last winter trimester at the Berg. Jen truly helped to push me outside of my comfort zone in a sport in which I was not only a complete beginner, but also one that I had zero natural talent for. The gymnastic movements, full body coordination, 
and mental commitment to throwing myself headfirst into the water was a foreign and honestly somewhat scary concept. Nowadays, that experience of being pushed towards the unfamiliar has inspired me to constantly search for other activities and hobbies, which also push me outside of my comfort zone, all of which has been incredible for my growth as a person. And I have Jen to thank for that. Additionally, my diving experience may or may not have saved my life during a climbing accident in my last semester. You guys can ask me about that afterwards if you're interested in the story, but I couldn't fit it into this already fairly long presentation. Finally, Pete, who I hope you're all familiar with by now, was my coach for all but my very last season and was my biggest role model as a climber, but more importantly, in terms of confidence and self-assuredness. Before I went to Mercersburg and before I joined the climbing program for the first time, I was a shy, timid, introverted, and very skinny small kid that was quite different from the person I am now. Joining the climbing program and seeing Pete and the other coaches every day and seeing their confidence and how they carried themselves when leading a climbing trip was incredibly inspirational to young Michael and it lit a fire in me to become more like them. Pete, above all, was someone I looked up to because of how extroverted he is. His talent for holding a conversation with anybody and everybody was a skill that I severely lacked at the time and that I was desperate to develop and hone. Of course, his skill and strength as an actual rock climber was also an inspiration to the scrawny, skinny kid that first joined the program. According to one of my friends who is actually on this call right now, uh, I definitely took these inspirations to heart as she recently told me on a phone call with her that my personality has basically become a slightly more subdued version of Pete's, which in my eyes is a huge compliment and a much desired outcome compared to my younger introverted self. Also, I'd like to think that I'm a decently strong rock climber now, although it can be pretty discouraging when you see a 12 year old kid at the gym climb literally double the grade that you do on the first try. Anyways, I, uh, I still look up to Pete in many ways, but I'm happy to say that I can treat him and the other coaches more as a peer and as a friend now. These four people were all incredible mentors to me at Mercersburg and I don't take for granted how they've helped me grow as a person. Thank you guys. There is one more topic I wanted to talk about though, uh, which arguably had just as great of an impact on me as my mentors, namely the social aspects of climbing in the outdoors and the friendships that I've made along the way. So during my first two seasons at Mercersburg, I did thirds boys soccer and winter track as my two PGAs. And I'll be honest with you guys, those were pretty miserable times. I had a ton of difficulty breaking out of my shell during those first two trimesters as all of our time was spent training or running and I never had time to really chat or to get to know my teammates. If i had had more self-confidence at the time, I might've tried hanging out with my teammates after dinner or on the weekends, or even try just tried making friends with my floor mates in main hall. But the reality was whenever I wasn't at class, the dining hall or at a PGA, I was in my room. It wasn't until I joined the climbing program in my third trimester that I finally began to actually make friends. Climbing is an inherently social sport as you generally work together with your belay partner and whoever else is in your group on how to climb a specific route. The Mo rock climbing program further expands on this by having students go on weekend outdoor climbing trips together. During my first season, since that was the only semester where all four coaches were present, two of them would run a trip on Saturday and the other two would run a trip on Sundays. And I was the only person who signed up for every single trip, every single time, because my weekends were so boring, otherwise just cooped up in my room all day. This was something I continued to do throughout my other three seasons of climbing and I can attribute a lot of my personal development and growth to going on all of these trips. I gradually changed from a complete beginner who was just excited to get off campus every weekend to a veteran that was the one setting up top rope anchors for the less experienced students. At the same time, this constantly accumulating experience helped to change me from that insecure small kid to someone who actually had the confidence to approach other people first and strike up conversations with them and eventually friendships. In fact, those were the closest friends I had at Mercersburg. Something about literally holding each other's life in your hands really brings people together. Some of these friends were also the ones who helped to pull me back from being so obsessed with just climbing as a sport 
and to learn to truly appreciate just chatting and hanging out between routes and just spending quality time in the outdoors with people that I truly cared about. To this day, the only people I have kept in contact with from Mercersburg are all climbers, every single one of them, because frankly, they were my only true friends at that time and I wouldn't trade them for anything. My mentors, my friends, and the actual knowledge I gained from the Mill Rock Climbing Program truly allowed me to thrive in college as a completely changed person. I always thought that Mercersburg's slogan of define yourself here was a bit cheesy, and frankly, it still is to me, but I definitely define myself as a climber. Climbing changed my cor the course of my life forever, and I have Mo to thank for it. Thank you. Michael, thank you. Those pictures are amazing. And I love seeing where you've gone as well as where you've been because, you know, the last few were uh, a trip you ran with um, with three other alums, yes, uh, but after you guys had graduated, which was really yep. very, very cool. All right. Uh, now we'll hear from Carson White. All right. Great. Can everyone hear me? All right, awesome. Well, it's good to see all these familiar faces again. I feel like I haven't seen part of my family in the longest time, um, but it's really hard to follow that up. Michael, I can barely hop on a treadmill and run to keep up with Paige. And when I go to a rock climbing gym, I just get embarrassed by like every three-year-old having a birthday party there. Um, but I'm gonna do my best and talk about what I did. Um, so this past January of 2020, I was lucky enough to travel to Moshi Town, Tanzania and uh, go ahead and climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which is one of the world's seven summits. Um, this program was actually led through my university, Elon University in North Carolina. And uh, believe it or not, I think we're the first ever academic program to ever lead a trekking experience um, on the mountain itself. For obvious reasons, there's a lot of liability putting a bunch of students out on one of the world's largest peaks. And for that reason, not too many people really do that. Um, but yeah, so if you look here, here are the first few images that we can go from my experience. Um, on the left-hand side, really just sort of encapsulates what the environment's like around the mountain itself. It's open grassland, a lot of agriculture, um, a lot of open farmland. And then the pictures to the right, you see some of the climbing party that we went with. So these are all students from Elon University that I had the pleasure to stick with and climb with and uh, get to know probably better than I've ever known anyone. Um, but yeah, it's unbelievable experience. So as far as you know, context goes of climbing the mountain itself, it's important to know that there's a few different ways you can tackle it. So there are multiple routes that you can take to go towards the summit. Um, I believe there's between four and five, and some can take as long as 16 to 18 days. And the route we took took four days to summit. So that route itself is called the Machame route. And locally it's known as the whiskey route. And they call that they call it that because you need to be strong like the drink to push through to the summit. Um, but yeah, the whole point is typically people would say that that would be the most difficult uh, route to take. They work towards the summit just because you're covering the most ground, the fastest ascension rate, um, in the least amount of time to allow your body to acclimate. Because obviously, as you're going higher and higher, you're limiting your oxygen exposure. And that being said, it can really throw you all out of sorts. Um, so we can go on to the next slide, please. So this is where the fun starts. This is where we actually get on the trail. Um, once we get on the route, one of the most amazing things I got to experience when I was on the mountain is that you cross between five different climate zones over the course of those four days. So the five are, as I, as I list them, the first, a rainforest, second, the moorland, third, the upper moorland, fourth, the alpine desert, and fifth, the Arctic cap. And you basically ascend through those in that order. And what's really amazing is because, you know, you'll wake up one day underneath a canopy of trees, having monkeys run around above you. And then by the end of the night, you're at a low vegetation zone where there's, you know, very little soil, all rock. Um, and basically you're waking up in one environment, going to sleep in the other. Um, but you'll see these two pictures here. I wanted to highlight one point is when you're on the trail and you're on the mountain, weather is incredibly unpredictable. So on the left-hand side, this photo was taken just 20 minutes before the picture on the right. Um, while we were on our climb, you'd, you know, in a matter of a day, come across four to five different rainstorms or weather events. And it was really hard to obviously prepare for that because, you know, whether you're 
wearing appropriate clothing at the time or not, you're going to have to deal with whatever's coming your way. So it definitely taught you how to overcome what was thrown at you and sort of work with what you have on the fly, get comfortable with the uncomfortable and operate in ambiguity. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is where um, we start to move towards, you know, the Alpine desert and we're getting further up the mountain. The one thing I always love to say, it was, it was some of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen in my life. Um, and you can peruse these different pictures here, but you know, every single day we we're met with a sunrise, a sunset. Um, and it's important to point out when I say sunrise and sunset, that's because every single day we woke up at around 6 a.m. and started climbing for between eight to 10 hours. So one of the things I like to point out is that it was a lot like a marathon in a sense that it was endurance. And, you know, we'd be operating from the second the sun rose to the second it set. And, um, you know, it was just an incredible time altogether. Uh, one of my favorite moments is down the center column you see in the lower picture. That's one of the members of the climbing party. We had dance parties pretty much every camp we got to, um, just finding ways to boost our morale whenever we were, you know, operating in the cold, um, wet, uh, sleep deprived, tired, hungry, um, just finding ways to pick ourselves up to gain the momentum to move forward. And um, I mean, as you can see in the lower right hand side too, some of those beautiful sights I ever saw. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that picture in the top middle column is uh, what is the start of the summit push. So when you climb Kilimanjaro, the day you summit and the day you reach base camp, which is the camp before you push towards the summit, those two days are blended together. And it's important to note that within that 48 hour span, you're up and climbing for about 36 of those hours. So it's a tremendous mental exercise. And um, you know, incredible feat of mental endurance. Um, what you can see there, it looks like pitch black and it's pretty blurry, but that's the last photo I got that night before I went on to the summit. Um, what you do is when you arrive at that base camp before you make your summit push, you've climbed for about eight hours throughout the day. You get to base camp at around 6 p.m. There you have about 45 minutes before you go and have dinner. So at around seven o'clock, we'll call it, you have an hour long dinner and you get ready to, um, you know, pack up your things, go back to your tent. And they tell you that you have about two hours of sleep. So you're thinking at this point, I've climbed for about eight hours that day, two hours of rest. And you wake up at around 10, 11 at PM at night. And then you be in your summit push towards obviously Uhuru Peak, which is the name of the peak of the mountain. So you climb for about seven hours through the pitch black, um, suspended around 18,000 feet in the air. And um, I remember one of the most amazing things and one of the most difficult things I ever did was get through that night. So you can see there's sort of a single file line illuminated by headlamps that everyone has on top of their heads. Um, I remember thinking, you know, I'm only a foot away from the person in front of me, but I couldn't feel more alone. And the reason I say that is because whenever you're in that sort of environment where you're pushing, you know, to fight to put one foot in front of the other, you're dealing with oxygen deprivation and exhaustion no one speaks and everyone's sort of going through their own mental battle to keep going keep moving forward um you know it is probably one of the most difficult things i ever did myself um and i talk about it a lot i call it like an ego death experience and the reason i say that is because it was a moment where i was met with sort of an immeasurable challenge that i wasn't quite sure how i was going to approach um, and it sort of broke down all the barriers. It broke down my ego. It made me forget about all these other things I was dealing with prior to the trip itself while I was on the trip. And it reduced everything I had to do in front of me to putting one foot in front of the other. And that experience itself was extremely humbling because, you know, it breaks you down and, you know, pulls down your barriers. Um, and then we can go on to the next slide, please. So this was summit of the mountain itself and this is one of the most rewarding things we ever got to see um the summit itself in the center picture here is called the uhuru peak which is swahili for the freedom peak and on the left hand side is probably my favorite photo from this experience itself um, that's a sunrise at about nineteen thousand feet in elevation and um, it's important to note at this point too um, obviously you can see we're in the arctic cap and it's about negative 20 degrees out with about 25 mile per hour winds um, I remember telling people whenever I arrived at that summit, you know, you're crying from the achievement. You're so happy and overwhelmed with emotion. 
but just in a matter of seconds, those tears freeze on your face and it's just pure discomfort at that point. Um, but yeah, it's, it was unbelievable to be suspended above the clouds, to see the curvature of the earth. Um, and then for once just feel extremely small. And I talk about that feeling of, um, you know, just feeling infinitely small because again, it's humbling. I think that outside of this experience on the mountain, whether it's work, study, whatever it may be, I think we're overcome by a lot of little things and a lot of distractions and anxieties. Um, but with this specific experience here, it was a great opportunity for me to sort of leave that behind and really embrace the environment I was in. And whenever you're sort of tackling any sort of challenge of this scale, um, you can't help but think of how insignificant some of those worries you had that you left behind that previous world were. And um, it's really eye-opening to, you know, what you care about, what you want to achieve. So um, going forward, this taught me a lot of things. I mentioned how to become comfortable with the uncomfortable, being resolute in ambiguity. Um, but, you know, going forward, one of my biggest goals right now is to climb the seven summits. And uh, my parents are on the call right now, and they're going to hate me for saying that because the idea of me going out and trying to tackle Everest is very scary to them. Sorry, mom and dad. Hope you forgive me. Um, but yeah, that's one of my greatest goals. And that would be obviously climbing the largest peak in all seven continents around the world itself. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's a lifetime goal of mine. It's probably going to be something I wouldn't be able to accomplish until, you know, the next 20 years pass by, but it's something that I can continuously work towards. And, you know, like all other challenges, it's important to aim high. And I think in this specific case, it gave me a taste for wanting more and wanting to push myself more and more. Um, and for that reason, I'm forever grateful for, you know, these moments, these friends I got to make, um, you know, the challenges I got to overcome and uh, the opportunities that I'll get to have going forward. Thank you. Wow. Thank you to all three of our presenters. It is, uh, man, super, just a kind of uh, awe-inspiring to see what everybody does after they leave Mercersburg um, and how the, their experience at school can have an impact. Um, Carson, you know, anytime I hear somebody who's graduated then talk about their things that they've done to embrace it, I'm like, man, it would have been so cool to do that with you here because um, you're not alone in, in people that leave Mercersburg and then uh, come to it on their own eventually. Um, it's is so fun to hear your story. Um, and I definitely think you need to talk to Ms. Sarah Bozzi uh, at some point because she is uh, slated to do Kilimanjaro in the not too distant future. Um, so I uh, I had wanted to, to tell everybody a little bit about Mercersburg, uh, what's going on now, because a lot of you have done, um, man, uh, you know, Trek or uh, a program like Endeavor that um, has gone through some changes and is no longer offered in its former uh, version. Um, but we are running low on time and I really wanna to get to some questions. So unless we have actual questions about what's going on in the Berg currently with our programs, one, you can find all that online at the school's website. Uh, two, I'm still on the call and if that's what you wanna know, I'll answer it, no problem. But I do want to uh, let you guys ask Carson and Michael some questions. And if anybody has questions for Paige, I'll relay those to her and, and we'll get some of those going. Um, the only thing I will say is why I believe uh, outdoor ed is important for our students. And um, other than, you know, it's COVID and getting outside is awesome uh, for everybody and has been a major outlet for every everybody on the planet. Um, the uh, ability to connect to nature and kind of what Carson was talking about, like um, feeling your place in in the space. Uh, for me, and I think many people, it's a sense of place, but it's also a, a non-denominational spiritual connection to the world. Um, and, you know, I'd love to talk about people's faith and all that kind of stuff, but the ability to talk about stewardship um, and the environment and all of the things after you've uh, taken people out is so much easier um, teaching personal accountability uh, when you know you have instantaneous consequences for not for things not going well the way Paige was talking about I think is an important feature as well. Um, but let's hear some questions um, and we'll we'll move on from there. So if anybody has things to ask of any of those three or me as well, um, go ahead and throw those in there. Uh, 
Pete Curtis, current student and cyclist, uh, would like to know about your diving skills and if they impacted your climbing at all. I can't say they it impacted my climbing ability, but I did mention <laughs> the part where I, it potentially saved my life. Um, so your I'll, falling I'll go, ability, Michael? Yes, my falling ability. Um, when you rip a rock off the wall with both your hands and no rope, and you start cartwheeling through the air, being able to dive and right yourself is pretty valuable. Um, so that that's the gist of it. I was bouldering with only one crash pad, and it was very the rock quality was very low. And I got to the top. I put my hands on a rock, and it happened to be a lo loose boulder that came off. Um, according to my classmates at, who were there, I did like tumble through the air, but I managed to orientate myself and land flat on my forearms. This, this one got really messed up, but I'm back to climbing and I'm, I'm stronger than I ever was at Mercersburg. So it didn't set me back too much. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I am going to, uh, to talk a little bit. Um, uh, we have Kirsten Cubit on the call as well as um, Elisa Gan. And some of my favorite moments with Mercersburg students have happened on our break travel trips or global programs as we call it. Um, and it was on, I believe, Elisa's trip uh, to the Grand Canyon that within the first day of dropping into the canyon, we came across Kirsten's brother uh, and, and a, uh, a friend hiking up actually. So it was, it was me and Sue and, and others. And, uh, and we just ran into Mercersburg people. And it's, man, those kinds of moments, so, so fun. Um, all right, we do have a question. Um, mm, yes, so there is a question from Sue Malone to Carson asking what programs you were involved in. And I can answer that for Sue very easily, which is uh, he, he didn't do any of the Mo programs when he was a student. He's come to it afterwards. Um, there also is a very tongue in cheek question talk, talking about uh, African swallow for Carson, if you'd like to answer the uh, uh, Monty Python joke. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that one, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Shout out to Tom. Um, one of the questions is talking about uh, major expeditions, which are, are tough. Um, do we have a chance to get outside on a more regular basis? And I think that's a good question for both Carson and Michael. Um, other than big major trips like Kilimanjaro, what is, uh, what's been your outdoors connection, Carson? Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, I'm in this big transition period right now where I moved to Chicago and started my job most recently. Um, but back when I was at school in North Carolina, there was quite a bit of resources out and around me. I was nested in the Smoky Mountains. So, you know, I was able to go and check out portions of the AT. Um, I don't know if that's one of my goals right now, but I'm always, you know, amazed by people who are able to, you know, cross the entire Appalachian Trail from, you know, top of Maine down into Georgia. But, you know, I was lucky to be in a pretty accessible part of the country for that sort of outdoor recreation stuff. Um, but largely what I did was mostly hiking and um, just finding the ability to get outside in any way I could that way. Uh, Amy Moore would like to know if uh, climbing that mountain was harder than wrestling, Carson. Uh, I think they're both mentally difficult um, in different ways. I don't really know if one was more difficult than the other. Uh, Jacqueline was definitely one of the <laughs> toughest coaches I've ever had in my life. So I don't know. I think Jacqueline might have taken the cake with this one. Excellent. Um, this. Uh, we're going to open questions up for people to to unmute and ask in person if they'd like to. Um, that has a potential for inviting chaos into this. But um, prior to doing this, I will ask um, if uh, Tyler Wilcox ever found his missing snowshoe. Uh, I'm still looking for it. Okay, that was from Sue Malone, by the way. Uh, there are just as I'm looking at the screen, so many really fun like webs go out um, as 
like experiences that I've had uh, with Rich uh, in Peru and Derry was there. Like each of you, I have all of these awesome little connections to, um, down to you know the the Bergens. We've we've just shared a little bit of space when I did a presentation for 3D design back in the day. It is really really fun to see all of these different ways um, that we're all connected through Mercersburg. Um, so at this point we are going to allow you guys to just unmute and ask questions. Um, we would ask, of course, for patience as there is sometimes a little bit of a delay. Um, if you find that you are being talked over or you're unable to um, do it, go ahead and continue to throw the question in the chat and we'll see if we can get to it. I have a question. Go for it, Ross. Um, at Elon or uh, Richmond or Purdue, did your undergraduate programs uh, also lead to all this? Are you are you asking if my university had a similar program to Mo or? That's right. Um, so, I they they do they have an outing club. Um, which isn't specific to just climbing. It has kayaking and mountain biking and all of that. I was never officially a part of the club because the only thing you need the membership for is to rent the gear that they had access to. And I already had all my own climbing gear and I'm not really interested in other outdoor sports. Um, but I was friends with a ton of the people in the outing club. And it was my core friend group. And we would go, we, we would drive four hours every weekend down to Kentucky um, where the Red River Gorge is one of the best sport climbing destinations in the entire country. And we would take that drive every weekend and climb for the cl climb our heads off for the entire weekend and come back and immediately start studying for engineering or whatever it was that was killing us at the time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and to piggyback off that too, I think largely all of my experience is the credit to Elon University. Um, like I mentioned, the program was led through their study abroad. And it was the first year they ever led a trip out there. And as I mentioned, it was the first time any academic program or university organization had ever led a trip like that. Um, but outside of that, like what Michael said, I think it came down to your peers, so your friends, what they were interested in doing, making time to do that on the weekends. Um, but I will say one thing I didn't mention, I owe a lot of that curiosity to want to go out and explore and see the new. So when I was at Mercersburg, um, I'm from Canton, Ohio. And it's not really an incredibly diverse or glamorous place, but I remember the groups of students that I was surrounded by at Mercersburg always made me curious to go out and want to learn more. Um, just the number of international students that I was able to see and live with across the hall always piqued my curiosity and made me want to go out and experience that firsthand. And I thought that, that was a beautiful thing. And that's sort of what started this motivation, this interest in me. And, you know, that's sort of something I could never pay back, but I'm forever grateful for but go Phoenix. Go Phoenix. <laughs> Leah uh, Cook, go yeah, ahead. I, I threw a question in the chat that was asking um, what you all thought about accessibility for outdoor activities, especially some that have um, like a higher cost of entry. And I, I sort of, I know I had some questions asked and I, I wanted to clarify um, like I felt really grateful as a student to have access to all the equipment and resources and like Michael was saying, um, all the, the, the trainers and the people who could, could mentor us and teach us how to do it. I'm curious, especially like I know Michael, you, you talked about gatekeeping and I, I was just curious your opinion on um, bringing other people into the sport or um, like how you've seen you or others address it, especially something like climbing that requires, um, like lead climbing requires so much equipment or backpacking requires so much equipment. That's a, that's a great question. Um, so I've seen climbing gyms around the country. Uh, it's not very common, but they implement a payment model more similar to a co-op where um, the members pay what they want. And if they can't afford to pay membership, they just get to climb for free. That's just based on the honor system and they get to rent the gear for free. They get to use the gym whenever they want. And I think that's a great thing that more people should be doing. Um, obviously it's not financially feasible for a lot of people, but it's one of the few things I've seen specifically in the climbing community that's making strides towards making it more accessible to 
um, less privileged people. Um, in regards to my specific situation at Purdue, um, we have a climbing wall, or I'm not at Purdue anymore, but we have a climbing wall there. And the, the membership for the gym uh, is free for all Purdue students. So if you go to Purdue, then you get to use the climbing wall whenever you want. And not only that, but renting the shoes, the harness, all of that is free. Um, you Joining the outing club, it's, it's only a $20 fee for the semester and you get access to all of that gear that you want, or you can just make friends with people in the climbing or in the outing club like I did. You don't have to pay any money and then you can just have those people teach you how to climb and take you on outdoor climbing trips. So that, I don't have too much experience with making it more accessible myself, but that's just a little bit of my thoughts on that. I'll, I'll talk about like this much. I, I think that no matter what, there's a, um, a diversity issue within the outdoors, socioeconomic um, being a pretty big driver. Um, uh, there are little day trips and, and ways that you can experience, you know, kind of nature and natural world in ways that where you don't have to invest in a $300 puffy jacket. Um, I think within climbing, um, it's one of the reasons why you see a huge explosion in bouldering, which for those of you that don't climb, is just like you need a crash pad and climbing shoes. And then you go and you climb 10 to 15 feet up on a bunch of rocks somewhere. Um, and it doesn't take a huge investment. So there are different levels and it's kind of stratified, right? And then you can get into uh, climbing outside, I think is the least expensive because nobody typically charges you for the rock. Um, you just do have to have some equipment and then there's the barrier to entry that is the knowledge of actually doing it. Um, most of us with hiking and that kind of thing, you'll, you'll get a lot of people that are hiking, especially now uh, in the time of COVID. Um, but the true uh, like multi-day mountaineering style stuff, certainly Kilimanjaro, but like even, even just like multi-night overnight type stuff, it takes a pretty big investment. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I love what we do within um, the schools uh, programs is we provide everything. Um, and, uh, you know, other than socks and underwear, which can be a little weird, um, through water bottles, stoves, backpacks, all that stuff, we we outfit the trips and we always um, endeavor to, to do that. Um, so we try to lower that entry as much as possible uh, to make, make sure that all students um, have access to, to learning how to do it. All right. Does it? We we probably have time for just one more question. If anybody has one, looks like Jim um, has a question about Paige. Okay. Um, Jim is asking if Paige is training for any crazy ultras right now. Um, I think that she is getting out as often as possible. And Jim, I will write to her because I texted her just like two minutes ago. She's legitimately like on her phone, letting her thumbs do some work while she's making rounds. Got um, it. That makes she, sense. Yeah, and she uh, is training a fair amount, um, but is, uh, as of right now, I don't think she has a particular race in mind. No, she does, she does. She's training oh, for 100, shoot. she's training for 100K in Zion, April 10th, and her fiance and his family will be crewing her. And I hope to see her when I go out uh, for my backpacking trip. So yeah, she's still getting it done, man. Thanks, honey. Awesome. You're welcome, honey. <laughs> <laughs> that was a delightful plant of a question you did. That was hilarious. He's downstairs. I'm upstairs. I was texting Paige to get the most accurate information because I would have thought she'd have shared that with me, but no. that's so good. Um, wonderful. You guys, thank you so much for <laughs> attending our session. Um, Holly, do you have anything that you want to say before we take... Um, no, um, just if, if anybody does want to stay on, um, we're happy to take on more questions. We, we wanted to keep this within an hour. We know we don't want to, um, everyone's schedules are so busy. So if you did want to kind of stay on and hang out and have a conversation with, with Pete and Carson and Michael, please feel free to do so. And um, thank you. Thank you. We're, we're really happy to um, have uh, the alumni and Pete, of course, to and all of you um, on our call tonight. So thank you.